All right, welcome back to another episode of Spill the Lychee Tea. Uh, today with episode number five, if I'm not mistaken. Fun fact, I don't know if you knew this, but um, the number five is actually my favorite number. So yeah, I hope this is going to be um, a good episode, right? <clears throat> my name is Stran Lee, for all those people that are listening in for the first time. And today we're talking about the mysterious murder of Room 1046. Um, this is an like unsolved um, murder case. It's the first murder case I think we have here. Uh, we did have like the last one was like an unsolved case, like a stalker case, but no one really died. But this one is actually going to be a murder case. All right. So uh, I hope that a lot of you guys are going to come up with like a lot of theories and share it with me. On Wednesday, January 2nd, in 1935, around 1.20 p.m., Roland T. Owen checked into the Hotel President in Kansas City into the room 1046. Um, his age was guessed by employ uh, employees around 20 to 45, and he was a white Caucasian male with brown hair, a scar on his scalp visible above his ear, and he was nicely dressed in a black coat. The bellboy, Randolph Probst, helped Owen to his room. When he helped him up there, um, his, belonging, his only belongings seemed to be a brush, a comb, and a toothpaste. So he didn't really have a lot with him, he didn't have a lot of luggage, and a Probst um, like, remembered this about this person a lot. <clears throat> The maid, Mary Scop uh, Soptic, sorry, <laughs> Mary Soptic, uh, sounds a bit like Soptic. Um, she cleaned the room while he was still inside of the room and was specifically told not to close the door or lock it since Owen was expecting a friend. Soptic said that the curtains were closed and barely any light came into the room and he kept all lights off except for one dim lamp. So this sounds like like, I don't know, like, I just imagine him sitting in the corner, like, on the couch and just, like, one light being on and it being so dark that you cannot see the entire face, but, like, you can see that there's someone sitting there, right? Like, that's what I'm imagining while, like, reading um, this about the story. Um, this was also confirmed by other staff members of the hotel that went into his room to clean up to bring him uh several things um and yeah like like just imagine like every time someone comes in like you're like oh there's someone in the corner you know like it's it's, it's kind of weird right this was confirmed by other staff members of the hotel in the maid's testimony to the police she mentioned that owen uh, owen seemed afraid or worried about someone or something and that he kind of um, looked suspicious, like he looked, he looked around suspiciously, right? Like he was even in his room, he was like paranoid that someone was in his room, um, and and yeah, like again, like this is this is like really weird. Like why would you like be afraid that someone would be in your room, right? Like you're, like he's so he so what I'm imagining, right? He's sitting in the corner. He only has one lamp on. All his curtains are closed so that like from the outside you can't see that there's someone inside of the room. He's sitting in the corner chair and looking at the door, basically waiting for something to come through the door. At 4 p.m. Uh, <laughs> at 4 p.m. <laughs> at 4 p.m., the maid came to change the towels of the room and was shocked to see Owen on the bed, completely dressed in the dark with the door unlocked. In the room was also a note that she saw that said, Don, I will be back in 15 minutes. Wait. Like, who lie, who lies on the bre uh, on the bed completely dressed? But also, like, it's 4 p.m. Like, it's not that late. Like, it's not like he's, like, sleeping, right? All right. We're jumping over to the next day. On January 3rd, the next day, the maid came back at 10.30 a.m. The door had been locked from the outside, so Soptic, the maid, was like, okay, Owen is probably outside, like, he's not inside of the room. He left, and he locked the room. She opened up the room, and again, Owen was sitting inside with the lights off. Someone else must have locked the door from the outside. Now, like, 
how creepy is this? Like, imagine you're like, you're like the maid, right? Like, you're like, oh, I'm gonna clean up the room. Like, trying to open, like, you're you're knocking at the door. Like, normally that's like how you progress, right? Like, you're knocking at the door, you try to open the, and like, you ask like, is anyone there? Like, housekeeping, anyone there? And then you try to open the door, right? Then you realize, oh, it's locked. There's no one sitting here. There's no one here. And then you open the, like, you lock, like unlock the door, you open it, and suddenly he's sitting in the corner again. <clears throat> And um, so, um, yeah, so she comes in, she sees that Owen is still in the room, and she assumes that um, that someone else must have locked the room from the outside. Um, while she was inside cleaning the room and stuff like that, he answered the phone, so the room had a phone with a phone stand. Owen answers the phone while the maid is still inside and cleaning up, and he says, No, Dawn, I don't want to eat. I'm not hungry. I just had breakfast. And then after a while he repeats, no, I'm not hungry. The maid then returned to room 1046 around 4 p.m. to deliver some fresh towels. <clears throat> Inside of the room she heard two voices speaking to each other. And when she knocked, a deep raunchy voice which, this, uh, which did not belong to Owen answered, who is it? Um, she continues to say that she was the maid and had fresh towels uh, and the same raunchy voice said, we don't need any. Um, Soptic then recalls that that was very strange because when she came in earlier the day, she took most of the towels with her, so there were no towels left in the room. At the same night on the 2nd January, uh, on the 3rd January, um, a woman in room 1048 reported that she heard a loud voices, a lot of loud voices, um, both male and female cursing on the same floor. Witnesses of that night weren't able to confirm that it came exactly from the room 1046, because in the same night on the same floor in room 1055, there was also a party. <clears throat> so it might have been people from 1055 going outside having an argument, right? But it could also be like that people were in front of 1046 or outside of 1046 having an argument there. <clears throat> in the morning of the 4th January at around 7 a.m., the hotel phone operator noticed that the phone in room 1046 has been off the line for a while. Um, she tells a bellboy named Probst, um, the, the guy from the beginning, um, to check in the room. He goes to room 1046, knocks on the door, uh, even though the door was locked and had the don't disturb sign on the doorknob, and asks like, Mr. Owen, are you there? Despite the door being locked and having the don't disturb sign, props knocked, um, props again knocked and heard a come in, like a low voice saying, come in, turn on the lights. But since the door was locked from the outside and no one was like letting him in, he was not able to get into the room and he just said like, uh, sir, please put the phone back on the hook. And then he left. A bit later at 8.30 a.m., this phone was still not in the line. So another bellboy named Harold was sent to the room with a pass key to open the room and check. Um, all the lights inside of the room were out, so there were the only lights that were illuminating the room was the lights from the hallway. Owen was lying in bed, naked, and the bellboy assumed that he was drunk. The bedding around Owen was also darkened. The phone stand was kicked over, so the bill bellboy just picked it up and assumed like, oh, okay, so he was drunk, he kicked it over, and that's why the phone is disconnected from the line. Uh, he picked it up, he connected it to the phone line again, and afterwards he just left. Around 10.30 to 10.45 a.m., the phone was once again off the line, so the original bellboy probes was sent back up, this time also with, with a hall pass with, like the, uh, with the key, basically. When he opened the door, uh, he was greeted by a horrible sight. Quote, when I entered the room, 
This man was within two feet of the door, on his knees and elbows, holding his head in his hands. I noticed blood on his head. I then turned the light on. I looked around and saw blood on the walls, on the bed, and in the bathroom. This frightened me and I immediately left the room and went downstairs." End quote. Owen had, uh, had apparently received horrible wounds all over his body. A cord has been used to tie up his hands, feet, and neck, and he might have been tortured. Blood was on the walls all over the room. Alright, so this is not like the kinky way to tie up like his hands, feet, and neck. Like This is like the, yo, I'm gonna beat the shit out of you and stab you, right? Like This is not like, yeah, like, oh, this is hotel, like... This is the last night, let's be a bit of kink, like, let's be kinky, you know? It's, it's like the negative form of, like, being tied up. His head has repeatedly hit, um, and his skull was fractured. His chest was stabbed numerous times with a knife, and even his lung was punctured. The cord around his neck might have also been used to strangle him. Now, like, what is surprising now is that even after all of this, Owen was still alive. They didn't immediately bring him to a hospital, so when a detective arrived and asked him about who could have done this to him, he said that nobody did it, and he stumbled and fell against his bathtub. That's his, that's his answer. There's blood on all four walls of the room. Um, the the bedding is also completely full of blood. So what what props or Harold? No, Harold. What Harold saw earlier, the that the bedding was like dark darkened around Owen, right? Like he probably thought that it was like his own making, like a puddle of his own making, like he was like vomiting or something like that. But it was actually blood. So so basically like He's saying like, oh, all this blood here? Like, yeah, I, I stumbled and fell against the bathtub. And then I received like 18 stabs into the chest. Uh, my skull was fractured. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was the bathtub. Like, the bathtub is the murder. He was hardly able to talk and barely conscious at the time. So the detective thought like, oh, okay, maybe he's not like able to comprehend what I was asking. Uh, or maybe that's like, like he's like, he's hallucinating or something like that. Like, that couldn't be the answer, right? In the hospital, a doctor concluded that the injuries had been inflicted six to seven hours prior to Owen being discovered. This means that by the time the phone was off the line for the first time, when props came up and knocked at the door and like, and a voice inside was like, come in and turn on the lights. At that time, he was already wounded. The wounds were already inflicted. Owen had already been massively injured by that time. No weapons nor any of Owen's belongings were found at the crime scene. So suicide was not an option. There was no knife, all his things like the uh, toothpaste and the comb and stuff like that. All that was already gone. Like it was not in the room anymore. Fingerprints were found on the phone and on the phone stand, presumably from a woman. Later that night, at midnight, Owen died. During his check-in, Owen also said that he was from Los Angeles, but all the authorities in Los Angeles weren't able to find anything about a Roland T. Owen. So his identity was not able to, to be checked, um, it was not able to like find his family members and anything like that. It's highly questionable if that was the victim's names and victim's name at all. His body was placed for viewing at Melody McGillay Funeral Home. The police tried to find out who Dan, uh, who Don was, right? Because like a lot of like the time, like the maid heard him say like, no Don, I'm not hungry. And s people also saw the note that said like, Don, I'm gone right now. I'm gonna be back in 15 minutes. So the police was like, okay, we need to find out who this Don is. So they were trying to find Don um, because there were several testimonies and and um, and like signs that were like pointing towards that Don person, but there was no person to be found. So there was no Don staying in the hotel and like other than like Don is like most probably like 
like a nickname or like a short version of a name like Donald or something like that. So it was really difficult and the police weren't able to come up with any suspects with the name of Donald. Owen's burial was then announced by the Journal Post on March 3rd to be on, a Potter, to be on Potter's Field. Before that date came to pass, Melody McGillay Funeral Home received an, an anonymous call that they would receive the money necessary to provide Owen with a proper funeral. So the Potter's, um, Potter's Field is like a place where like people get buried that have like beggars or criminals like people that don't have like the money to have like a proper funeral um so that's like the potter's field where and and so so that he would not be like buried there someone called and said like yo we're gonna send you guys the money uh, give owen a proper funeral on march 23rd money was delivered to the funeral home bundled up in a newspaper funeral flowers were also anonymously arranged and delivered by the rock flower company Attached to the flowers was a card saying, Love forever, Louise. These flowers were then placed on Owen's grave. Now this is spicy, right? Who is Louise? We also found uh, fingerprints on um, the, the phone stand that was presumably by a woman, right? So, like, who's Dawn? Who's Louise? A year and a half later, in 1946, Ruby Ogletree would identify her son while reading up on the Owen case in an American weekly. Her son, Artemis Ogletree, left Birmingham in 1934, and at the time of his death, he was only 17 years old. After her son's death in 1935, Ruby Ogletree received three letters from her son. She was suspicious of the letters since they were written in a very unfamiliar way. And those like letters were like sent in spring of 1945. Um, if you guys remember, like the whole thing, like the whole murder, like happened on probably the 3rd or 4th uh, January of 1945. So these letters arrived months later after his death. Um, she was suspicious of the letters since they were written in a very unfamiliar way. Artemis Ogletree had also stayed at the San Regis Hotel in Kansas City, reportedly with another man. Now, a lot of people think that this also might have been this Dawn person. The last information about the case was released in the early 2000s by Dr. John Horner, who published an extended, an, an extended report about the murder case published by the Kansas City Public Library. He received a call about the case of Artemis Ogletree. The caller found a box with newspaper articles about the case in a deceased elderly person's belongings. The caller said that there was something else in the box that had earlier been referenced in the newspaper articles, but the caller did not specify what it was before he hung up. So, there are several theories about the case, but most of them are just like nowadays like the police closed this case um and and never rolled it back up because there was no like there were no hints as to who, who could have been the murderer it was like quickly just like yo we, we're not gonna talk about this anymore so most of these theories are like a partly uh, out of the internet one of the theories is very straightforward the man called Don beat Artemis Ogletree to death in room 1046. Um, since the police was never able to find out who Don was, it's like, the, like, it's a solid theory, I guess. But like, no one really knows who's Don and why would like, and it, it leaves a lot of questions open because like, why did he kill? Like, why did he kill Ar Artemis? Why did Artemis travel under the pseudo pseudonym? You know, like, why did he call himself uh, Owen? Uh, why did he not reveal his killer with his dying breath? If if Don just like beat the crap out of him, like why did he j not just say like oh it's Don, blah blah blah, like his name is 
this and this and like his place is there like what is what is the relation between dawn and artemis that 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 there was so much secrecy behind this right and why like if they if it was like just a killer or like i don't know like maybe f like friends or strangers falling out with each other why would dawn kill him and then send him money and flowers for the funeral and then also presumably send the fake letters to his mother because the person that killed him the like the person that who sent the fake letters to his mother must have had knowledge of the death of artemis and faking these letters right um so what's the connection here like there it's there's so many like there's so many like questions left open if you just say like okay you know what like don went in killed artemis and that's it right how like whose fingerprints are on the telephone stand like there's just too many like too many questions open in this one so i i don't think like i don't like this one because it's just it's just trying to make it far too easy the second theory is that don didn't act alone another witness claimed that on the night of the murder he saw a commercial woman on the floor a uh, commercial woman i i haven't found out a lot about it but it it could be like a very like it would it could be like a pg word like for the newspapers to describe a prostitute um so it, it could have been a prostitute she was next to a big tall bald man in a white t-shirt the witness claimed that the woman was also looking for room 1026 to meet a man it's possible that she mistook 1046 for 1026 and was looking for Artemis Ogletree. She was later seen with another man, like with yet another man, so three people, and she could potentially be the woman that left the fingerprints on the phone stand. Now, if we if we remember remember the night, in the night there was like a party. So like there was a woman in 1048 that heard like a woman and a man argue like loudly on the floor. At the same time, in 1055 was a party. Now, if we say that these people had nothing to do with the party and the party was just in 1055, it was like a bit farther away. These people might have been around 1026, like in between 1026 and 1046 and arguing about like which room it was that Artemis is staying in. Because they're like, fuck, we need to find this room. Like, where the hell is it? Right? And then maybe like checking up with this third man, maybe that person is Dawn. Uh, or one of the two per like men could have been Don, and then the third person then saying like, "Yo, he's in this room. Like, go there and then kill." So basically, two people were used to like commit the deed. Like, three people knew about it, but two people like committed it. So the big bald person and the woman, the woman basically standing uh, close to the phone, uh, maybe leaning on the phone uh, phone stand, watching uh, while. Um, the, the big man, the tall, bald man with the white t-shirt was um, like torturing him and stuff like that. The woman could also have been the person that's like Louise, you know, because like the flower said, like um, eternal love, Louise, right? It could, it could have been that person. There's also like a theory, I, I haven't wrote it out, but like, I think it's worth a mention here. So there's also like a theory that, um, that it could have been a lover's quarrel. Like, um, so uh, Owen was traveling, uh, Artemis was traveling under the, um, the name of Owen and fell in love with a woman. That woman uh, like was also in love with him, but he cheated on her. Right, and then, um, and then they like, like he gets her friends or something, or family, um, to like beat the shit out of him, uh, and while doing so, while torturing him, he like reveals that he's Artemis, uh, where he came from, where he lives, and please like send a letter to my mother or something like that, and that, um, yeah, that that basically because she was still kind of in love, like she she wanted to kill him because like he cheated on her. Um, but because she still loved him, she sent like the money and the flowers for his funeral. It's it's also a few, like it's it's a fury, but like it's not my favorite one. Like I I'm like okay yeah it, it might be. Right? Um, 
So, what's my paper, a personal favorite theory? This is one that I like, that I like thought about a lot. I found a few comments on different YouTube videos and like different, different uh, forums that like talked about this. And I think like this is, this is pretty solid. Now, we have to remember that in the 1935s, that was like the golden age of the mafia, right? Um, the time of the prohibition, you know, the roaring 20s, the golden 30s, you know, like that kind of time. So, uh, like, the organized, cr like, crime, organized crime was, like, really big, right? Um, criminal families that were of Italian descent, of Irish descent, and so forth. So, this theory says Artemis Ugaltree was part of the Mafia. And Don wasn't actually a name, but the Don is a rank, or I think the Don is the head of a Mafia. Right? So Don is not like a name, but Don as in like no Don, like Don Corleone, right? So he's like no Don, I don't want breakfast. Um, there's also like a lot of people like that suggest, uh, you know what, like we, we come back to that like later. Let me just like finish the theory first. So Artemis changed his name uh, because he doesn't want to use his real name. Obviously, if you're part of the mafia, you don't want to like run around. Oh yeah, this is my legal name, right? Like, so he used like a fake name. He just came to America basically a year ago, and he he maybe because of money or something. Like maybe he came to America because he wanted like to get a new life. He wants to like have a new job and stuff like that. It doesn't go that well. He gets into contact with uh, the organized crime. And when he's asked, like, oh, what's your name? He says, like, oh, my name is Owen, you know? Um, he also didn't tell the police the name of his murders because he thought that they have ways to harm his family back in Birmingham. Um, and, like, this this is kind of proven because, like, like, they knew the address of his mother to send her letters. So either way, either, like, if they knew before where he came from, or if after the torture they got like he re revealed that he was like not Owen but he was Artemis Ogletree from Birmingham, um, like he knew that they knew where his mother lived. So in like when the police is like, "Hey, like where are you from?" He doesn't say like, "Oh, like the people that killed me are." the mafia or like organized crime he just says like oh i stumbled to in order to like protect his um uh, to protect his family to protect his mother basically um the presumed murderer of artemis knew the address of his mother to send the letters that's proven they knew and the mafia families do care about their members right like even if they kill them even if like unless they're rats unless they're rats and like like revealing some mafia informations to the police that's like the highest crime that you can do as like a mafia member but as long as it's like something else maybe cheating with like the don's daughter or something like that or some internal strife they have like a huge respect for each other so they kill him but they don't want him to be buried in the potter's field they say he is a member of the mafia even though we did have to kill him because of whatever um, we are going to have him, like, have a proper funeral. Not in a potter's field, but, like, in, in like, a proper, like, graveyard. So it's not too far-fetched to say that, like, maybe the mafia killed Artemis and then sent money and flowers to his funeral. At the end of the day, we can just confirm that Owen slash Artemis wanted to keep the identity identity of his visitors and possible murderers a secret um, but he was also trying to call for help several times the phone line was was um, disconnected twice so the first time it was disconnected and at 7 a.m the phone operator like sees oh the phone in 1046 is um, is disconnected to the line we we sent someone up there he's already saying like come in turn on the lights as like kind of like a code word like hey i need help come in open the door please right like that's what i think so he's already trying to like beg for help but like in the most unsuspicious way possible um then 
Um, then the second, the second time is, so, on the second time they check on him, um, the bellboy named Harold reconnects the telephone line with the uh, the telephone with the telephone line, right? But like two hours later, the telephone line is cut again, and that's when Props comes in and sees him with his head in his hand blood everywhere you know and him just like being in that crouching position being tied up and shit so he like the second time he must have deliberately knocked the phone off the phone stand again like as a way to call help right maybe maybe there was like i don't know if like in 1945 there were already like um surveillance equipment that like could have like allowed people to listen in from the telephone even if it's not used so he didn't like just use the telephone to like call like for help but instead he kicked off the line i don't know if the equipment was already there but it might have been it, it, there might have been equipment like surveillance equipment for the telephone right but we don't know that for sure like we don't know that for 100 percent um but yeah i think that was like a way to like to like call for help and then like he also like the first time like the maid was in and like was cleaning up shit he was like he picked up the phone so he answered the phone and he was like no dawn i'm not hungry i just ate breakfast and then he finished with no dawn i'm not hungry maybe that was also like already like a code word trying to like let the maid know like hey something's wrong here like I checked in alone, but like there's another person coming. Like I need help. Maybe we don't know. We can't say for sure. Mm. Is there another thing? Mm. I don't think so. But yeah, like again, like there, I think there, like he was really trying to like get help. It's just like that people were like too afraid to like get into the get into the room, right? And it must have happened. It must have happened in the night of the party because at 7 a.m he was already injured so they must have infiltrated his room before that so in the night and again like there was a bald person a tall bald person seen with a woman and a third man like that can't be a coincidence i don't think that's a coincidence they must have had something to do with this and since it's for like free people, I think it's more likely to be like organized crime than like a family. And again, like his lung was punctured, his skull fractured. Like they were very, very violent with him. I mean, a family that's trying to avenge like their sister that has been cheated on, possible, but definitely a mafia could have been like that. Like they could have been ruthless like that. In my opinion. But yeah. The hotel did send people to his room. Um, if they had called the ambulance the first time the phone was disconnected at 7am. He might have survived. Because like again like when they found him he was still alive. And he only died at midnight. Because of like I, I would assume because of blood loss. Um, but like we will never know. Um, so yeah that's, that's just a theory. A T theory. So what are your thoughts on the murderer? Who could have been the murderer? Um, did he do it himself? Maybe by the bathtub? Was it the bathtub? Do you guys think it was the bathtub? Um, yeah, what are your theories to what happened? Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, leave a comment um, and uh, like the video and subscribe for more content. And yeah, thank you guys so much to, for listening in. And um, I would love to hear your theories. See you guys next week with uh, another episode of Spill the Lee Chi Tea. Have a good night.